Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Infinity Fast Forward webinar series. My name is Steve Kessler, and I'm going to be the host for the program today. Uh, we do appreciate everybody joining us uh, this morning, and I think we've got a really good uh, program today. It's very timely. Uh, our topic today is roadside inspection preparedness uh, and how that can help keep CSA at bay. I think that's very important. We're right in the middle of Operation Safe Driver Week, and also we have Brake Safety Week coming up August 25th, so I think the timing is excellent uh, here for this program. A uh, couple of things before we uh, before we get started, uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, uh, everybody that's joined the webinar is muted, which means we can't hear you. So uh, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the, the little chat box there. There's also a choice for a Q&A. So if you have a question that pops into your head, you can go ahead and put that in there. And then we'll try to take those questions uh, uh, at the end of the end of the presentation. So uh, in fact, if you all want to, why don't you just jump on the chat and say hello, tell us who you are, where you are, and who you're with, uh, so we can see who's out there uh, joining us today. We had a really big registration, so there's uh, close to 300 people that want to join. Uh, let me introduce a couple of our folks. Uh, joining us today also is Mark Ray. Mark has been uh, co-hosting our webinars uh, for quite a long time, so most of you know Mark. He's a transportation executive for, what, 35 years now, I guess, Mark? Certified uh, Director of Safety. Yep. Uh, so it's been at this for quite a long time. So uh, uh, thank you for coming. Mark, what do you think of the program today? Oh, I, I'm very interested to see what Keith has to say about a couple of interesting topics, such as data queue. When and should our uh, clients challenge uh, violations and what are the risks, if any, in doing that? The other thing is you know, roadside inspections uh, with the safety management system are a reality of our industry. And I think it's very important that the carriers uh, provide training to the drivers on what to expect, what, what the uh, officer that is going to inspect, and probably more important, how to conduct yourself during a roadside inspection. I hear some of the wildest stories in the world on uh, drivers that do not conduct themselves professionally and it's not a, not a good start to a roadside inspection. So, uh, it's, it's not a perfect, uh, system, but it's the best mouse trap out there. So I'm really looking forward to Keith's, uh, in, uh, information today. Great. Thanks, Mark. And, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest. Uh, some of you that have uh, joined our webinars in the past have heard Keith speak before. Uh, he kind of goes by the uh, uh, moniker of uh, transportation nerd. Uh, Keith's kind of grown up in the transportation uh, business uh, as it relates to safety, especially. He currently works as a transportation content creator, training programs manager, and an SOP developer. Uh, prior to his current role, he's worked as a safety trainer delivering crash classroom instruction, post-incident training, as well as conducting job hazard observations. He's also served as a certified commercial examiner for the state of Iowa, conducting CDL testing and skills assessment. So uh, Keith really uh, is uh, uh, focused on effective training and feels like that uh, can help guide uh, people down the proper path. Half. So without any further delay, Keith, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And uh, uh, we're anxious to hear what you've got to say today. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Sure. So yeah, uh, roadside inspections, right? Uh, certainly a, a current topic with this being Operation Safe Driver Week. Um, we've already seen you know, CVSA International Road Check pass us by, and here in a few short weeks, we'll have Brake Safety Week in August. Uh, but aside from that, aside from these, you know, uh, specific roadside inspection events, in general, being prepared and ready for roadside inspections is, is and should be 50% of the job. 
right? Because if we're not doing good out there, we're getting CSA points. And if we're getting CSA points, we're not looking too well as uh, as a company. It's hard to stay afloat when the points aren't looking good. That that affects business, that uh, you know, affects business opportunities. So all in all, uh, a bad route, but but at the same time, there's there's opportunity to prepare yourself, prepare your drivers, and uh, be ready for the road ahead. So what we're going to talk about today is common violations, uh, a general mindset, preparedness, vehicle inspections, annual events, and education. So primary categories that, that I'm going to focus on here is our common violation categories, and that's going to be hours of service, which is uh, nowadays all too common. And you would think ELDs uh, helped, but I I think we've we've all recognized that that's not, not necessarily the case. Uh, vehicle maintenance certainly brings in enough points for any company and unsafe. So it's no surprise that out of the top 10 CSA violations surveyed year over year, uh, hours of service accounts for three out of five of those violations. So out of the top 10 hours of service, three out, or three to five of those violations. Uh, that problem is becoming bigger for a number of reasons. And most common uh, you'll see is no record of duty status, uh, standard form and manner violations, uh, failure to retain the past seven days of logs, failure to maintain eight blank logs and failure to maintain the ELD instruction sheet, right? And these are all things that for the most part, a driver should have ready within arm's reach. That's those blank logs. Uh, that's the ELD instruction sheet. And that's understanding how to produce or supply the uh, enforcement officer with their seven days uh, of, of past logs. Form and manner violations, uh, are a bit different than we used to see, right? We're not talking about not being able to uh, draw a line neatly on paper logs. Rather, what, what we see more so nowadays uh, is failure to enter in trailer number, driver number, um, your co-driver information, the shipper receiver information, bill of lading, all of these things, again, that a driver has at their disposal, but knowing where to put it uh, and when you should put that information in there, which should be as soon as you get it, right, uh, often leads to violations down the road. So asking yourself, are your drivers filling out the applicable load information on the LD as they should? So something as simple as form and manner uh, and trailer information, or in form and manner, trailer information, bill of lading, like we talked about, becomes those violations. Uh, and these account for 25% of all hours of service violations. So form and banner, 25% and simple things that we can fix. Vehicle maintenance, brakes, lights, tires. That's our BLT, right? Brakes, lights, tires. And something that we should check every time before we start our trip, mid-trip, uh, and at the end of the day to make sure that nothing's changed while we're going down the road. So take a look at your vehicle maintenance violations, let's say in the last two years. What you'll find most often that comes up are things like audible air leaks, uh, flat tires, fabric exposed, tread depth below minimum, and inoperable headlamp where required, ABS light malfunction, brakes out of adjustment, mismatched brake chamber. A lot of these things that we can teach to, and uh, in general, that a driver can inspect, recognize, and help prevent points by writing things up on a DVIR and getting a vehicle service before they go out on the road. But oftentimes what we find is that a driver has a sense of urgency and commitment to get out onto the road and not necessarily take care of what's happening first. Um, and that can be, you know, that's not only, that's not necessarily a, a driver problem, right? We don't want to point the finger uh, at the driver here, but it's it's all of our problem, right? It it may be push dispatch. Uh, it may be uh, a driver wanting to get home soon. We may be close to a holiday and we just got to push it and get out there. Uh, all these things contribute to getting violations in these cases. Keith, Keith, I had a question going back to hours of service, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. Downloading 
for the uh, inspector your hour your change of duty status is that just a if, if the driver is the driver is it a violation if they can't do that or just a good practice for the driver to be able to download those for the for the officer so it's one it is good practice right we you, sh you should teach drivers how to do that but uh failure to supply those logs is a is a violation failure to provide to the dot officer right and it's it's simple most elds nowadays have a very straightforward transmit logs option uh and even in you know depending on the situation let's say a driver is is unable to and that may be due to connectivity or uh you know where they're at if we're out in uh timbuktu texas you know that may be hard to do because we don't have the connection that we need uh, it's just as easy to pick up the phone and reach out to your uh, e-logs department and say, hey, I need to transmit these logs, right? We we have more options than just what is on the truck. Uh, but part of that means providing the driver a resource for help. And that's our dispatch and driver managers uh, who know where to go and know, know who to get a hold of in these cases. So, so the driver assisting certainly sets a favorable tone to the inspection. That it does. That it does. So, and then last but not least here, unsafe. Uh, according to the FMCSA, one of the most common violations is speeding six to 10 over the posted speed limit. So you might ask yourself, well, I've, I've governed my vehicles. How does my governed vehicle get a speeding violation? Hopefully you're not asking yourself that. Hopefully you know right where this happens at. Uh, downhill, right? Speeding downhill and speed limit changes those speed zone traps going from a uh, 65 to a 45 as we enter into a rural area. Anybody that's driven north through uh, through Oklahoma has seen what it's like to every 15 minutes hit another little town and you've got to slow down from 65 to 45, 35, and then back up. That's where those violations happen. Uh, and oftentimes these speeding violations are on the heels of inattention. There's a lot going on in that cab. There's a lot going on out on the road, and it's pretty easy in the in the blink of an eye to, to miss a sign. Uh, so teaching to scanning and general principles of looking ahead and being prepared for what's on your route really fall into that. So inspections are often looked at as a bad thing. And this mindset normally comes from bad results during inspections. It's the typical condition response, right? Negative outcome in the past. Uh, so it's automatically a negative thing. Inspections can and should be looked at as a positive event, event right? Uh, it's, it's the power of numbers, right? More failed inspections obviously means more CSA points, but uh, more past inspections means diluting those numbers, right? So when we've got drivers out there that are, uh, you know, kicking butt and doing the right thing, and you, you know these drivers who make sure their truck's ready to go and they're uh, hauling it every day, getting it done, not picking up hours of service violations, not even ones that uh, are happening on their ELD aside from getting inspected. These are the people that we one want to model, but two that we really hope go through a way station and pick up a clean inspection because that's dilution and that's that's what we need. Um, so we can reduce our ISS score, or mandatory inspect, and in general, more money in your driver's pockets. It's easy to think about things like safety incentives when you're not having to uh, worry about loss of business for roadside inspections. Think about paying for clean inspections, right? It it benefits you and it benefits the driver, uh, you know, to provide incentive for inspecting the vehicle beginning of the day, mid trip, every time you stop. Uh, but two, to look forward to going through that way station because one, I know my truck's ready and where it needs to be, and two, uh, it may mean some more money in my pocket. So if you're not paying for paying your drivers for a clean inspection, uh, you should. You should add that to a forward-thinking safety plan. Uh, quick uh, interruption here. I, I've noticed on the chat here is a comment that 
uh, someone feels like uh, with inspections, the, the cards are stacked against us. Inspections are never a good thing. Uh, any comments about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it can seem that way, especially, uh, you know, if every time you feel like you go through a way station, you are getting violations. When, when you think about it, just on the surface, the driver has to know uh, at minimum 336 points on that vehicle you know, of inspection that can be hit. Um, yeah. You know, I was I was talking to a driver who's been driving for uh, millions of miles, millions of safe miles, and he got something, uh, a violation for something as simple as a washer, right? And you, you'd, you'd look at that and you'd go, well, that, uh, that DOT officer was, was searching. He was reaching. You may be right. You may absolutely uh, encounter somebody on a bad day, but you are never going to get clean inspections. You're never going to get the results that you want if you're not pushing towards that. So it can make anybody uneasy pulling through a way station, but it should be and can be a positive interaction. Uh, you're going to have bad eggs anywhere yeah. and violations are going to happen, but it comes down to know-how. It comes down to making sure we're doing the right things before we get there and really, a lot of the most common violations happen from items that are recognized within the first few minutes of an inspection. Those things that happen right then and there at the cab, aside from your, you know, audible air leaks and things like that. I'm talking about what happens with the uh, driver interaction. That's that's our ELD issues right there. That's our uh, not having, you know, not taking care of the things that we're required to take care of as a driver, as ourselves. Um, so start with your first fruits and focus on focus on being ready when you go in. And we'll we'll kind of talk about that here. So as you're pulling into uh into a way station, this is not the time to think about what's on the window. Is there a bunch of crud on your dash? And are your documents ready uh to be handed over to a DOT officer? Keep things like if you've got paper bill of ladings, if you're hauling hazmat and you've got to have, uh, you know, hazmat paperwork, if you've got to have the, um, you know, the hazmat field guide, um, you know, close by, do that. Have the things that you need to have out and ready to go and expect inspections to happen. And specifically, when you get pulled into a way station, don't take off your seatbelt right away. That's an interaction for the DOT officer, right? Um, our job at that point is to make sure that we're ready for when they get to the window, right? If they tell us to pull it around, we need to be ready for them to get there. And that means having everything in order and getting yourself in order before they get there. Uh, but positivity goes a long way here. And it's you see it all too often. Officer gets to the, to the door and the driver's pissed off. That's... That's understandable, right? You've got a lot to do. You've got a you've got a tough job, and your day is oftentimes well. You can drive eleven hours. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to spend only eleven hours working that day. These are long days for these drivers, uh, and an impedance like a roadside inspection, if seen that way, can be frustrating. So we have to change the mindset, not only for the company but also for the driver. At the end of the day, this is just somebody that's trying to do their job. And they have to, because the goal is to make sure that we have safe roadways. And I'm sure we can all appreciate that because every one of us has been out there and had to deal with a crappy driver going down the road. So in general, like I said, attitude is everything. Uh, keep your seatbelt on until you're uh, confronted by the DOT officer. Before you even get out on the road, make sure you have something like a binder where you've got a spare ELD instruction sheet. You've got eight blank logs. Uh, you've got a spot where the BOL can go before, you know, you go down the road in a binder or a folder that can sit right above the driver's head in that cubby so that in the event of an inspection, those items are ready to go. Um, make sure that during these, you know, inspection seasons, just as the DOT is stepping up their inspection rates, you should be doing the same for your own vehicles, right? Get communication and notifications out to your drivers, uh, but at the same time, encourage stopping in 
and make sure that you're doing extra maintenance checks. Pay attention to those critical items that are visual first items. So visual first items are going to be things like any missing holes or rivets or tears in the side of the trailer or the side rail, uh, any tire issues, look at your rims, make sure they're not rusted, make sure you don't have you know, any kind of oil spray or pooling, even if it's something minimal, that's that's just, uh, you know, one leap away from a leaking hub seal. Uh, keep an eye on things like ABS lights. Make sure that you're getting your vehicles cleaned. I can't tell you how often you see an ABS issue uh, simply because you've got dirt and corrosion and things like that down around sensors that end up causing issues and end up causing that light to come on for an issue that's not even really there. And no, unplugging the ABS light is not the solution in this case, right? They're going to look. They're going to look. Uh, but do yourself a favor. If you're if you're a member of safety, or even if you're not, walk up to one of your trucks and take account of the first things that you see. Those are the items that you need to focus on as critical items before drivers get out on the road. And drivers should be doing the same thing. What are the first items that you see and what can you do about it? So those are trainable uh, opportunities. They are. They are, absolutely. Um, we certainly have the opportunity to, to, to train to these things, and we should be on a regular basis, right? It's a, I think we'll jump into this here as well, but if you, if you go through and take a look at your most common violations uh, seasonally or over the past couple of years, those are the items that you should be teaching to. Right. Obviously, we need to teach the meat and potatoes of a, of an onboarding classroom, making sure, you know, people understand hours of service regulations, um, you know, hazmat materials compliance, HM 126, things like that. But at the same time, you should be teaching two common issues and common problems. Don't just throw a standard training package at the wall and hope that it sticks because you're not doing your drivers a service and you're certainly going to pull back, uh, you know, pull out. Uh, CSA violations on the other side of it. Yeah, and and somebody made a comment. I don't want to jump around on 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 taking. Don't be afraid to take pictures in the event that you need uh, that picture for a data queue challenge. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Um, especially right our uh, out of service violations, things along those lines. If you, I'm not going to say if you think it's wrong, it's probably wrong because that's. That's not the case. But if you feel uneasy about it, if your driver doesn't feel right about it, take a picture. And the DOT is not going to say, no, you can't take a picture of that thing that I just wrote you up for. Um, if they do, that's a whole other problem, right? And you can you can certainly do something about that. But certainly take a picture, certainly document it. Um, and if you do feel like something is wrong, we'll just jump into data cues here. If you do feel like something is wrong, if you picked up a violation that uh, shouldn't have happened. Or if you look and you've got stacking, right? Somebody's hitting you for light, 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 light. Well, that's a that's that's a stacking violation, and we shouldn't pick up points for for each of those. Uh, something as simple as having the pigtail disconnected between the tractor and the trailer, and having your lights out. That doesn't mean you should get a uh, violation for every single one of those lights. So if you see something like that, that's stacking, and that's a situation where we need to data queue it and submit it. Looking at parameters of when and where you should data queue, if you don't feel it's right, you should. No harm, no foul, and and submitting it. No, uh, you know, crying wolf here. It's important to advocate for yourself and for your company, uh, or to be an advocate for yourself and your company rather in these situations, because you're not going to get rid of nonsense, I, nonsense violations, I hate to say it like that, um, or non-violations, we'll say it there, uh, without doing something, right? So submit data cues, it's 100% worth your effort, uh, and the FMCSA or, uh, portal makes it all too easy to do uh, when you're taking a look at your, your SMS. And, and supporting that challenge with a, a a picture is significant. Correct. Correct. And in general, uh, best practice is have your drivers scan in or send pictures of any inspection, passed or failed, right? Pay them for past inspections. Make sure you got a picture. 
failed inspections, uh, get a picture. And if it's not right, you're going to need that for the data queue. So be sure that you have it, whether that's that's transflowed, if you're still doing that, or if you're just snapping a picture on a cell phone, that'll work as well. Uh, but make sure you have evidence to support it and make sure you understand what you're combating. But it is 100% worth the effort. So if you've been on the teaching side of the industry long enough, you've probably heard the question, how long should it take to perform a vehicle inspection? If you've taught onboarding uh, or if you're uh, one of these companies that has a, a, you know, an internal uh, driver training program, uh, how long should it take to perform a vehicle inspection? And you've, you've probably got one driver in the classroom who says, oh, I can do one in 15 minutes. There's always one. Uh, but what it comes down to is it takes as long as it takes to do it right. And you have to, you have to push that. That's, that's the important thing, right? If just in general, if I go out and check my tires, right, what's the DOT looking for? The DOT is looking for an issue uh, with a tire. They're looking at every major groove to decide whether or not there's a violation there, right? They're looking at the sidewalls, they're looking at tire condition, they're um, looking to make sure that, God, let's let's talk about rims, wheel ends, everything that's going on there, just at one tire, um, tire pressure, all of this. If I took my time to inspect each of my tires the right way, rims, tires, wheel ends, I could probably spend 15 minutes doing that. Right. So it really does take as long as it takes to do it right. Um, and think about seasonal issues. You know, if you're driving in the north and it's negative 30 out, it's probably going to take a lot longer to do a proper vehicle inspection than it would be if it's uh, 70 and sunny. So what does right look like? What does a correct inspection look like? Uh, so on the screen here, you can see a copy of the FMCSA recommended uh, driver vehicle inspection. This tells what items we should be inspecting, but it does not tell, tell us how to do so. And that in general is something that a driver should know how to do, but providing a general checklist to your drivers uh, is a great idea, having something in their back pocket. And one of the best things that you can do for yourself is go to the source, uh, the FMCSA, and get a copy of their most recent suggested vehicle uh, inspection checklist and provide that to your drivers, whether that's in digital form, uh, you know, physical paper, laminated with a, with a dry erase marker that they can reuse. Uh, it's in general good practice to make sure that we are inspecting everything that we need to. And certainly never a bad idea to hold refresher classes if you get the chance, especially for some of the smaller companies here. If you've got 10 to 25 drivers, that is one heck of an opportunity to get everybody together on a regular basis and say, hey, let's go over this and make sure that we're doing this the right way. Remember in general that we are creatures of habit, right? So building uh, these habits, inspecting the same way every time, looking for the right items every time builds up a uh, habitual process. And that's something that we need to ensure uh, that we're ready before we hit the road. So provide a checklist, make sure we're doing it right every time, and build the right habits from the beginning. Make sure that your DVIRs are being completed. And vehicle maintenance violations noted by inspector but not noted on the DVIR is the third most common violation according to the FMCSA. Things the driver may have noticed, but in general, if it's not documented, it does not exist. If we've not put it down, it does not exist. So if we've got an, uh, you know, we're inspecting the vehicle, we're out on the road, and you find an issue, and you reach out to, to dispatch, and they say, you know, we've got a, a terminal an hour ahead of you, keep heading that direction, we'll get you taken care of there. One, we're pushing the driver through through a violation. Uh, two, the driver should be writing that down. But if they get stopped there in the meantime, we've not written that down. We've not noted it. Uh, your 
less likely to find a lenient DOT officer in that situation. So if it's not written down, it does not exist. Make sure that training around inspections and way station procedures is easily accessible. Um, Infinity is a fantastic resource for doing this, right? Loading up the material that you need to uh, into the Infinity system and providing that to your drivers is a fantastic way to go. Uh, using the content tool to either provide your own training or using their library in that sense. Uh, but something I highly recommend is to make sure that whatever training you're providing to your drivers, you're also providing to your driver support staff. Your dispatchers, uh, fleet managers, operations managers, even safety personnel should be taking the same training so that they can have the same reinforcing conversations uh, when they are talking to your drivers. It's easier to talk on the same level when we already know uh, what we're talking about, right? Even if it's even if it's common knowledge, even if it's stuff that you know your operations and, and safety members know already, this is still good material to review. But at the same time, I'm informed on what my drivers are being informed of. And that's a current place and time conversation. So blitz and safety events, aside from general inspections, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, and hopefully everybody on this call knows this, but uh, the DOT has three primary inspection events, or the FMCSA and CBSA has three primary inspection events throughout the year. That's International Road Check, uh, which happens in May this year, 14th through the 16th. Operation Safe Driver Week, that's right now, July 7th through the 13th, and just like it suggests, safe driver, meaning the unsafe category of CSA, is our focus here, right? Speeding, inattention, distractions, all those things. Uh, and then coming up in August, 25th through the 31st, is Brake Safety Week. And then there's always one uh, Brake Safety Blitz or Brake Blitz, that happens. That's a one day event. Uh, but last year they focused on more than just the breaks in 2023, not only for that uh, one day unannounced blitz, did they focus on breaks, but they also focused on securement. So again, something that we have to be ready for uh, and have to be expecting. Um, 2022, Mark, you might remember these numbers last year, 2022, 38,117 inspections. 13% of those were out of service violations or 4,955. As we round ourselves back to this year, much less inspected. But if you notice that percentage there, 18,875 inspections, 12.6% out of service violations. So still the dilution is the same, right? I, I don't count a 4% uh, variance as a uh, as a win here. There's plenty of opportunity to be made up there. Um, something as simple as, and if you were if you were in the ring for this uh, international road check, what were we talking about? We Well, we were talking about leak down pressure test. We were talking about um, the tractor protection systems that, that are on vehicles. And something as simple as a leak down pressure test with your brakes, right? Shutting off the truck, making sure, well, keying the on position, making sure your warning lights and signals come on, making sure your brakes set where they should. Uh, but fanning the brakes all the way down in most automatic vehicles is going to allow for the slack adjusters to readjust, recalibrate, get our slack adjusters back into, uh, you know, where they need to be no more than, right, one inch of slack. And gets the vehicle ready for uh, for hitting the road and hopefully not encountering any brake violations. But do yourself a favor, teach leak down pressure tests and make sure that your drivers are doing them. Because on the other side of that, we also get to look at things like, is the governor charging up how it should, as fast as it should, and is it charging to the proper range for operation? So all kinds of things that you can check here. Uh, and, and aside from all that, we're also able to tell if we've got air leaks. So 
break safety weeks coming up. We're already in the heat of, uh, you know, operation safe driver week, but do yourself a favor, suggest something for your drivers to do and put it out there and make it common practice and get in front of them and invite them to do it with you. So in general, let's talk education. So train to retain and train proactively. Failed inspections, 99% of the time, in my opinion, are the direct result of missing knowledge. The other 1% is carelessness, but missing knowledge is what we're gonna focus on here. Uh, if you want to see better inspection scores, if you're tired of seeing violations, um, get posted daily, weekly, um, or a month and a half later, if you're picking them up from Arizona, because those take some time. Uh, if you're tired of disciplinary action forms, then you have to get proactive if, about training. You have to train to retain. Don't train to retrain. So make sure that you're training to the violations that you're seeing come in. Make sure that you're speaking to people and not just letting violations go by. If a driver goes through and picks up a violation for audible air leak, uh, or, you know, tread depth less than minimum, or, I mean, any number of, of items that can happen. That's a training opportunity, and that needs to happen. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, hey, this is your job, right? But it it should be a, a point of conversation because you're doing yourself a favor and you're helping instill the proper expectations. So the next time we go through a uh, a way station, next time we get inspected, we're hopefully not picking up those violations. That is why the DOT built or the FMCSA built uh, the inspection system for points to expire over time, right? Because the idea is that when you get inspected, that interaction, that event is going to lead you to be safer. So hopefully the farther you get away from that event, the better you're getting at what you're doing every day, whether that's reducing complacency or whether that is increasing knowledge. So use learning and fuse disciplinary action. It's not just a, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, it should be, hey, here's an issue. Let's train on it. Right? It doesn't have to be the end of the world. We don't have to have uh, an angry conversation. It's an opportunity, and we should be teaching because at the end of the day, it is a hard job. Being a, being a driver is a hard job out there, and there is a lot to do. There is a lot to remember. Uh, so a little bit of empathy along with training goes a long way. Use your common CSA violations in your training. I know I talked about it before. Look at the past two years of your CSA violations and look seasonally at your violations. Look at what's happening during the winter season. Look at what's happening during the spring season. And when those times roll around again, teach to those violations. Understand hours of service. Do a deep dive on hours of service. And if you don't know it enough yourself, learn it better before you teach it. And there are resources out there. Understand out-of-service violations. I can't tell you how many times you get somebody that's got an out-of-service violation and they miss that OOS on the paperwork or on that inspection paperwork and the driver drives away. So. Yeah. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, even if the DOT officer doesn't say you're out-of-service or we're shutting you down, look for it. And this is, this is where sending in those pictures helps. Have your driver send in a picture, pass or fail, and make sure that before they move, you look at it and they look at it. We both okay that it's for them to move. One one comment on out of service uh, that I've certainly seen in the courtroom is uh, that information can, can be obtained by a plaintiff's attorney. They can find out if the driver had had a previous or uh, the equipment being operated in a lawsuit was involved in an out of service, prior out of service violation. And you know, the next question, what'd you do about it? What'd you do about it? And uh, a blank stare does not do, uh, do you any favors in, in, in lawsuit and mitigation. Correct. Correct. You gotta, it, you gotta respond to those out, those out of service. You gotta document your response. Absolutely. 
the it, in this day and age we are we are in the nuclear verdict era you should consider everything discoverable consider everything discoverable and cya is one of the best things that you can do in this industry nowadays uh so to kind of wrap this up why do we inspect b b what, one one other question: yeah. Do, Is it your opinion that there are still we've been we've been in the SMS CSA system now for tw twelve years? Are there still a large population of drivers that are confused on how CSA points are generated and 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 how they come and go and just just general confusion on the system? Absolutely. Uh, what a confusing system in general. Right. We've got let's say I've got a flat tire. That's eight points plus two out of service points times three years. So it's 30 point violation. Year one, that's worth 30 points. Year two, that's worth 20 points. Year three, that's worth 10 points. Year four, it's gone for the motor carrier. It's two years split six months, six months, one year. That's rough math. This system was, in in general, uh, I hate to say it, but not designed for uh, simple comprehension that, at all. So aside from teaching how to uh, in inspect vehicles, teach about the math here and teach about why it's important. Talk about thresholds and where you might consider a driver risky, right? At, at what level of points do you say, well, this this driver is more of a uh, risk than a reward. Uh, talk about that. And I don't just mean to yourselves and at the company. That should be an open conversation you have with your drivers. Inform them as to uh, why these things are important. Make sure that they understand the math and make sure that they understand why uh, they're placing themselves at risk when they do pull in points. And certainly <laughs> for yourselves, uh, make sure that you understand how this all impacts your your ISS score, right? How this all impacts mandatory inspect, right? If you're if we're sitting over threshold and uh, you know in 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 our categories, uh, you know one or two categories, we're finding ourselves in in that mandatory inspect category. Um, it's time to do some learning math, and it's time to revisit how we are attacking CSA or teaching to CSA or teaching CSA prevention. Education is the primary means to reducing CSA violations. And beyond that, communication is the other half of that tool, right? Don't just communicate out via uh, your training platform. At the same time, make it a company culture. Invest in uh, you know, standardized communication, text, email, put up posters or digital signs if you got them. Uh, but as a driver outside of my truck, I shouldn't have to walk 10 feet without seeing something that tells me why it's important to be safe. Yeah, maybe that's obnoxious, but at the same time, I'm going to get the point. And we're all going to be of the same mind. And until that happens, we're going to keep getting hours of service violations. It's skin in the game, and we've all got it. Yep. That's what I got. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Keith. I was I was waiting to see if there's uh, some more you were going to touch on. Uh, what, what, uh, one, one, other, one, one other question. I know I know yes, we're primarily talking about tractor trailer, you know, combination vehicles, straight trucks, straight trucks that are hauling freight. Are they subject to uh, the same roadside inspection rules as a tractor trailer combination? That they are. Uh, as a matter of fact, what's a uh, gross maximum vehicle weight rating? Twenty six thousand and one. Yep. And if you're if you're finding yourself there uh, and if it is used for commercial purpose, absolutely. Uh, you can certainly count on uh, being pulled in and you can count on inspections mattering right these are it pays it yeah. pays to play so so they they are not exempt number two are i, I know primarily state agencies uh highway patrols uh what about city uh jurisdictions can they do a roadside inspection that 
can can hit a CSA score? Yes, yes, sir. As, as frustrating as it is to see that come in, uh, you betcha. If they are, because, you know, being a uh, certified examiner, being certified in, uh, you know, submitting points to the SMS system, that is nothing more than a certification, right? It is at any law enforcement level, and in those cases, we'll say a, a city officer, a DOT officer, uh, you can absolutely be trained and take the proper certifications that would allow you to provide uh, violations in, in these cases. So if you get an inspection that comes in from, uh, you know, uh, regular state or, or city officer, you bet those, those points count. If the points are there, the points count. Gotcha. And just one other general comment. We've got some great questions, by the way, but uh, another general comment that I've seen in in, in the litigation world, uh, they deposed the driver and, the, and, and the, he got put out of service two years ago. And they'll ask uh, every time, uh, were you, what, tell us about that out of service. And in almost every time the driver will say, Nobody told me, nobody at my company ever told me anything about, uh, CSA violations. I didn't know anything about it. Um, that's something you can control. That's, that's a, that's a, a risk that can be managed and online training and documentation, custom content. I would highly recommend to all the viewers, uh, do your own custom content on how to prepare. What is a CSA inspection? How to conduct yourself, what to prepare for. Uh, that's something you can do yourself, and, and it's very effective, and it can come in very handy uh, in the event that you end up in a lawsuit. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can recall that, right? And uh, especially uh, in a system like what you guys have with here in Infinity, those are uh, searchable training records that you guys can provide uh, oh, in the uh, event when, when, somebody when, needs them. When the, when, when the driver answers, nobody told me, uh, which is very, I mean, almost exclusively that's what I hear from the driver when they're when they're uh, deposed. Nobody told me, nobody told me, nobody told me. You, you got a counter to that. You, you might have forgotten, but you were told. Correct. And that's, that's a, an additional teaching opportunity, right? Think about how much you're throwing at drivers uh, in the very beginning. If you throw everything at them in onboarding, but don't talk to them afterwards, you're setting them up for failure. Think about a regular communication cadence and think about a regular training cadence. Yep. Uh, we shouldn't learn just, about just... CSA and how that affects us in the very beginning and then hope that I remember it, you know, six months to a year down the road. Um, set yourself up a training calendar like we talked about here a couple of weeks ago and train to it and make sure you have regular training topics. Hey, Keith. Yes, sir. A um, couple of other questions here. Uh, some really good information coming out here. Uh, here was a question that came in a little bit earlier when you were talking about uh, uh, the mobile uh, powers of service devices. Uh, someone's asking, is not having mobile device for keeping uh, record duty status mounted in a fixed position and visible to the driver, a violation? And is it an unsafe driving violation or an hours of service violation? Well, so you so, didn't have it mounted in a fixed position or it's not visible to the driver. Is that a violation and what kind? It is a violation. Okay. And it's, it's hours of service in this case, right? Unsafe would be use of a handheld mobile device. Gotcha. Um, and and that's what we would want it to fall into if we're we're talking about you know using a uh, mobile device mobile device that requires more than you know one touch for operation as the DOT says it. But uh, in this case, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mark, that's an hours of service violation. Yes, and that that also would be one that you could challenge pretty easy uh, with a picture if if the if the police if the highway patrolman is incorrect in that assessment. Correct. Correct. And it's it's certainly a good idea to have a standard uh, mounting location for your company, yes. right? If you, especially if you've got the same tractors, uh, get a bracket and put them in the same place. Uh, another question here. Um, 
that uh, came in a little bit earlier, how does a clean inspection numerically dilute the CSA score? So it's it's as simple as good outweighing the bad, right? It's the, I don't want to give the, uh, you know, oh craps and attaboys adage, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 it really is, isn't it? It's, um, if I've got two bad violations and I've only got one, or if if I've got two failed inspections and I've only got one clean inspection, uh, then then I'm sitting at a deficit, right? But the more clean inspections I get, uh, we we start to dilute those numbers out. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So the more you're going to be inspected, more so the more clean inspections you get, the the more uh, the other violations are diluted down. So that that does right. make sense. Correct. Uh, here's another question, and I, there, there are a few more, too. Um, could you discuss about self-adjusting slack adjusters and the importance of applying brake pressure as you enter an inspection station to help the adjusters self-adjust? I can read that again. No, I'm, I'm following you there. Uh, so I... I've heard this. I don't know if I'd 100% rely on it, but uh, laying into those brakes uh, as you come into the way station, uh, fanning down those brakes as you come into a way station. Some say uh, you'll you'll get a few different uh, folks tell you different ways to do it. In my opinion, and uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, love it or hate it, when you're doing your vehicle inspection, fan down your brakes. That's the time to do it before you start your trip. Because if you're going into the way station, laying into your brakes, hoping that your automatic slack adjusters adjust, that is the wrong time to be doing it. Yeah. And they they will be in adjustment if you're maintaining your vehicles properly and if you are doing a regular brake leak down pressure test as a part of your pre-trip inspection. Um, I mean, automatic slack adjuster has been around since 1994. Four, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are these are pretty sophisticated systems. Yes, absolutely. There's some merit to laying into your brakes heavy as you come into a way station if you've got the room to do it. Uh, but at the same time, we don't always have the room to do it. We've certainly seen during these inspection events, trailer tractors and trailers stacked up for a quarter mile outside the way station when they finally start turning people away. Uh, so the opportunity is not always there. And even in that case, fanning them down while you're sitting in line is not prime. All right. Uh, let's see if there are other. Uh, here's a, a question. Uh, as a private motor carrier in the construction sector, are we required to maintain a bill of lading in our CMBs? So in, in, in this case, let me see if I can weed through that. Um, it absolutely depends on the shipper consignee that you're working with and picking up from. And if, in this case, their freight or your freight is subject to regulation at that point. What, I, what I'm saying here is, are we going to be above weight? Um, do you have a DOT number on the side of your vehicle? And are you personally subject to FMCSA regulations, right? If we don't have a DOT number on the side of that door and we're not utilizing this freight transfer for commercial use, then picking up in this case is is not going to be something that that um, you're going to be picking up points for, right? right. Hauling in, in that case. However, if you do get pulled over and uh, you know things aren't properly secured. Um, you know, in a manner that they should be, but you're not subject to DOT violations. Could you pick up another violation uh, outside of, you know, standard FMCSA regulations? You betcha. That's, uh, you You can certainly pick up a ticket or a violation in that case. So it still pays to play, right? It still pays to uh, make sure you've got all your ducks in a row. Yeah. I mean, you've got oil field guys, right? That's a lot of that's private. The second you get past the dirt, yeah. it's, uh, you know, anybody's guess 
as to how things are transported. But, you know, in, in this case, some of these companies are subject to it and some of them aren't. If you're privatized, more than likely what uh, what you need to look out for in, in those cases is are you doing things the right way so you don't in general pick up citations? Right. Got you. All right. Well, uh, let's see. We're we're getting close on time here, but I wanted to take a few more questions that I saw pop into the the chat here. Um, says <laughs> this is a good one. How do we handle failing an inspection for an item just repaired by maintenance, <laughs> i.e., slack adjusters, brake chambers, etc., and affects our CSA scores? <laughs> Get that That's truck a maintenance in. issue. It sounds like. Yeah, get that truck in immediately. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a truck that you just put out on the road after maintenance was completed and the very same item picks up a, uh, you know, uh, picks up points for, you know, malfunction or anything along those lines, that vehicle needs to get in for service because one of two things has happened here. One of three things has happened here. One, uh, somebody was just checking the boxes on filling it out. Two, something happened in transit in that part malfunctioned uh or three that part is completely fine and you have grounds for a data queue so don't waste time get that vehicle into the shop but before that driver even moves get pictures good idea perfect um here's a question how to handle warnings versus citation when officer review refuses to give a citation, what can we do? It's my understanding, I guess, that if it's a warning given, it's more difficult, if not impossible, to challenge. Correct. Yeah. Um, and in these cases, uh, the best you can do, to my knowledge, is is ask for, uh, you know, I, I'd really rather this be a citation. Um, and there's there's not much you can you can do in that case, and it stinks and you don't see it all too often, but when you do, it is very frustrating because it's, uh, and when we get a warning, it's, it is fault and it's, you know, it's admitting fault, especially when we then have to sign that warning, right? Say, Hey, here's what I'm, here's what I'm writing you up for. I'm just giving you a warning. And it's a trick in conversation, uh, in these cases say, no, we're going to, we're going to let you go. I don't want to give you a, a citation today. We're just going to write you up, uh, a warning sign here and you can be on your way. Um, encourage your drivers to do everything that they can to ask for a proper written uh, inspection. Yeah, it does mean CSA points to the driver, but you're going to you're going to you're going to deal with this anyway. Uh, best to deal with it in the right way. And if 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 you run into that specific situation where you've asked for it, you don't get it. Uh, that is that is unfortunate. And in that case, to my understanding, that's the luck of the draw. All right. Uh, here's a question. Uh, it says, if a driver put the placards out, I'm guessing this is hazmat, and took pictures, but the placard flew away during driving, will the DOT give the ticket as he has proof that he did put the placard out in the first place? One, it depends on the officer. Uh, two, it, it, in, I would say if the placard's not there, the placard's not there, right? That's the way that I would look at it. Yeah, um, they're, they're going to base it on what they see correct. at that time. Correct. And what's not going to, uh, what's certainly not going to help you is if the driver stopped anywhere in between when that picture was taken and when they were pulled over for that, uh, you know, for that inspection. But nine times out of 10, uh, what you see is what you get, and you're going to pick up a violation in, in, in that situation. It's, it's much in the same that, you know, your lights were fine when, when you started your trip, but a headlight went out. Well, that's, a, that's an inoperable headlamp violation, uh, unfortunately, even if you have pictures of it. There you go. Um, let's see. Here's another question. Uh, I had a driver get a nail in his tire during transit. He was placed out of service. Can I data queue this violation? You can data queue anything you want, uh, but. That's probably not a winner. <laughs> it's probably not a winner. And yeah. if you've got pictures, 
Uh, you know, that helps if it's a superficial nail in a tire. It's just in, in this case, that's that's not a winner. It does pay though, uh, you know, pay attention when you're when your drivers are doing tire inspections. Um, you know, what's the what's the DOT say? When you first start your your trip, you should be inspecting your vehicle within the first 150 miles or uh three hours, whatever comes first, right? Right. First 50, then three and 150. Uh, so certainly as a part of these mid-trip inspections, we know not everybody's going to be stopping on those uh, intervals, but get out and look. And if you've got a superficial nail and a tire, you can pull that out. I know uh, I know a number of drivers with a pair of pliers that'll take that out if it's just a tread, if it's just a tread nail, right? right. Yeah. Um, but no, in this situation, I don't think you have any grounds. Right. All right. Thanks, uh, Keith. Uh, we, we've kind of come to our hour time limit. Uh, I know some people obviously have to go, but one of the things I did want to mention is I think you touched on it very nicely, Keith, is a lot of the uh, things that we need to do require training. And uh, you, you thankfully, you uh, for us, you mentioned our, our system, Infinity Workforce System. What I wanted to do is for those of you out there that are not uh, current customers, if you have some interest in... Uh, how our platform could help you uh, train your drivers and uh, make those uh, uh, bits of information uh, that are required uh, uh, easily accessible. You know, we have a nice mobile app that the drivers can get access to training. There's also a resource area uh, within our system where the drivers could have copies of of uh, uh, the uh, e-log uh, instructions. They could have... Uh, uh, various documents available to themselves there. So I just wanted to pop this up on the screen. So any of you out there um, that want to learn a little bit more about us, we will happily uh, follow up. So Keith, uh, this was a really good program. Uh, some of you may have a few questions yet, and we'll try to reach out to you after the fact to uh, uh, get those answered. I'll, I'll take care of that. So uh, Thank you all for joining us today. Keith, thank you once again thank for you. some really, really great information. And uh, 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 we'll ask uh, all of you, if uh, you have time in the future to join uh, our next webinars, we'll be sending out invitations. And uh, uh, thank you all for coming today. So Keith, thank you much, sir. Thank you. And, uh, Mark, thank you. And uh, we hope you all enjoyed the program. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Keith and Steve. Appreciate it. All right.